Lifting Up Jesus, Opening His Word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live in England via Skype with James Jacob Prash, and this is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends, and thank you for joining us on This Week in Prophecy. As always, quite a week it has been, and quite a week it promises to be. Let's begin with archaeology this week in Israel. Only 10 feet from where an inscription referring to King Hezekiah as King of Judah had been found, confirming the historicity of Hezekiah's existence, contra some liberals and theological liberals who tried to suggest he was an invention. A new fragment has been found, an artifact, which contains the name of the prophet Isaiah, quite possibly Isaiah himself. It is being referred to as the Isaiah Signature. It was found on the Temple Mount wall, the Southern Mount excavations, uh, and it's dated 8th century BC. It is known as something called a bula, a bula, a seal that you put on an official document to authenticate it or make it official or legal. And it was only found 10 feet, discovered 10 feet from where the artifact of King Hezekiah was found. I'm here with Alat Mazar, Dr. Alat Mazar, a Jerusalem archaeologist. Today is a big day for Alat and her team, uh, which we're very happy and excited to be a part of. Earlier this morning, Alat released news of her latest, uh, let's say, important discovery. That was the discovery of the seal of Isaiah the prophet. Uh, Dr. Mazar, maybe you could tell us a little bit about this discovery, why today is such a, such a great day for you. Well, it is a great day, but you know, uh, for us archaeologists, we're having a great day almost every day on the field. And uh, me and uh, my grandfather, Professor Benjamin Mazar, the late Benjamin Mazar, uh, excavating the area of the Ophel and the Temple Mount, surrounding the Temple Mount walls for almost 50 years. So this is very special uh, efforts and we get most interesting finds all the time because it's a very focused, important area of Jerusalem, of ancient Jerusalem. But now, today, it's a special day in regard of this special find of maybe Isaiah the prophet. This uh, seal impression, which is a little tiny clay uh, with Hebrew letters that says very clearly, Yao. This is, there is no question about that. It, it belongs to Yeshayahu, to Isaiah. Yeah. Now, yeah. is that a prophet? Yes or no? We have three out of four needed letters because the last letter, the Aleph of Navi, the prophet, is, was smashed by the person, maybe Desire the prophet, right. who held the little tiny clay and pushed his seal against uh, this uh, soft clay. Right. So maybe his fingerprint was the one that damaged the last letter of Navi. Right. Which is a, and it says a part of the of the word. We cannot uh, we cannot assume that this is a prophet without this last aleph. Right, right. So we are, have a problem. Right. We know we found it together with the seal impression of uh, King Hezekiah. Yeah. No question about that. Yeah. But uh, the same context, an eighth, uh, early seventh century BC context in a royal quarter of ancient Jerusalem yeah all fits yeah. we miss the Aleph right right so just to just to review we have a, a bulla a seal impression we know for sure that it says Isaiah Absolutely. Uh, and with one missing letter we would have the word 
profit. Yes. Uh, you can read more about this on thetrumpet.com, The Key to David City. We've produced a 12-minute video uh, explaining in detail this latest discovery. Now, the news of the discovery only released this morning. Uh, have you had have you had many phone calls or have you had much attention? Are people interested? Well, the phone doesn't stop ringing, <laughs> <laughs> which is okay. Uh, we are very excited about people getting interested in what we do. Uh, it's not always very clear. Sometimes we face problems of all sorts, including that kind of um, problem, <laughs> the Aleph, yes right, or no. Right. Well, it, this is part of the science. Yeah. It's not come. It doesn't come easy. So what are people are excited about with this bowler? What do you think? Why do you think your phone's ringing off the hook? Look, the chances, good chances that we do speak about the seal impression of the prophet Isaiah. Right. It's yeah. not like we can say we it, it is not. Uh, the same way we cannot say that it is even more um, we can say that it is, then that it is not. Yeah. So it, difficulties are there, and, yeah. pe and people are very much involved. They are eager to study right. how close uh, we can get into the biblical re reality. Yeah. Uh, and this is what archaeology is all about. Yeah. How can we make things as tangible as possible uh, in light of the biblical stories yeah. uh, and, and effects and yeah. narratives? Uh, this is a busy place, as you can hear right. in the background. Yeah. It never, it's never quiet here. Uh, so never mind that. Uh, in the center of Jerusalem, yeah. uh, the old, the ancient Jerusalem, you know, between the Temple Mount on the north and the city of David on the south, yeah. we are excavating the royal quarter that King Solomon built, yeah. and it existed and continued to be used until the very end of the first Temple period, until the Babylonian destruction. Yeah. So it's people are. They love archaeology for good reason. Yeah. And we work very hard in order to reveal a very scientific, precise, uh, methodological uh, archaeology. Yeah. Great. So that's, you heard Dr. Mazar say it. We're right here on the Ophel, right at the, uh, the base of the Temple Mount, overlooking looking Jerusalem. That's the Mount of Olives in the background. Uh, just in conclusion, you're conducting an excavation right now. We have 11 or 12 students uh, working with you on the excavation. Maybe you could just give the audience just a, a really brief summary of, uh, of what you're excavating right now. Well, every excavation at the area of the Ophel is very important. The participation of the students is crucial. You know, hardworking, eager to, to reveal and devotion that is unparalleled of. And uh, we are very uh, privileged to have the students working with us. It's uh, uh, going on revealing even the Byzantine period, even the first temple, the second temple period. Uh, we reveal all periods because it's part of the history of Jerusalem, yeah. which you are very interested in. Yeah. It's not the first temple. We are going, you know, layer by layer by layer, revealing whatever comes up. We put the same effort at every layer. And at the end, we pick up, you know, what are the best parts to be presented to the public, most preserved parts, depends. But each period, each period of the existence of Jerusalem's history is getting to be presented at this very large site. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Just a few words from Alap Mazar. I'm sure the next day or two could be quite busy for you as you do some more interviews. We appreciate the few minutes. We love being with you here at The Dig. And uh, we look forward to, to uh, joining you with for lots of lots more discoveries thank you so much we love you all again consistently the archaeological record has gone against the presuppositions of liberal higher critics that these stories are fabrications or oral tales that have no basis in history some have even gone so far as to suggest there was no king david their big problem however is not conservatives or conservative evangelicals their problem is archaeology and reality this week in prophecy the lord allows us to have enough archaeology to validate the scripture but only enough there are for instance only a few places in israel where you can say jesus stood here one of which is the first century stairway near saint peter galacantru to the house of the high priest he would have been parader on those steps almost certainly also, the excavated southern temple steps leading up from the area known as the Milu, connecting the original city of David with the southern access of the Temple Mount. Jesus would have likely walked almost certainly.
and the apostles walked on those stairs, and that's where this Bula of Isaiah's signature was located. God always gives us just enough. The main discovery, of course, being the Dead Sea Scrolls, the uh, Quran literature. Now, God gives us enough to authenticate the historicity of his word. But he doesn't give us more than that. He would not let us, or not let Israel know where the corpse of Moses was buried. It was hidden from Satan by divine intervention. Why? Because they would have built a, a monument and worshipped Moses. You see this absurdity of Roman Catholicism and Greek Orthodoxy throughout Israel. In Capernaum, the Roman Catholic Church built a church the size and shape of a flying saucer from a sci-fi movie and imposed it upon an archaeological dig which they claim spuriously without any basis to have been the house of Peter. This is what happens. They worship the place. God will not give his glory to another, not even to a Moses or a Peter. But in his providence, he does give us enough archaeological evidence to support the historicity and reliability of the biblical manuscripts. And we have another instance of that this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, something remarkable happened. Following an address to the United Nations in New York, where Mahmoud Abbas stated that the modern Palestinian Arabs are the descendants of the ancient Canaanites, he found himself in a problematic situation. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in the Middle East, including the Palestinian question. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of Israel to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. I propose that the Council invite the President of the Observer State of Palestine to participate in this meeting in accordance with the provisional rules of procedure and the previous practice in this regard. There being no objection, it is so decided. On behalf of the Council, I'll, I welcome His Excellency, Mr. Mahmoud Abbas, and I request the protocol officer to escort him to his seat at the council table. Now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Mahmoud Abbas, President of the Observer State of Palestine. Shukran. Thank you. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, Excellency Sheikh Sabah Al Khaled Al Hamad Al Sabah, President of the Security Council, Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, Excellencies, members of the Security Council. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of God be upon you. Seventy years have passed since Palestine's Nakba took place. Since then, six million Palestinian refugees continue to suffer from the cruelty of exile and loss of human security. They continue to wander the world after the loss of their peaceful and stable lives in their homelands. They are part of the 13 million Palestinians whose country has yet to be recognized as a full member state of the United Nations. Despite the numerous resolutions reaffirming their right to self-determination. and despite resolutions reaffirming the right to statehood as well on their national land.
Excellencies, we are the descendants of the Canaanites that lived in the land of Palestine 5,000 years ago and continuously remained there to this day. Our great people remains rooted in its land. The Palestinian people built their own cities and homeland and made contributions to humanity and civilization witnessed by the world. They established institutions, schools, hospitals, cultural organizations, theaters, libraries, newspapers, publishing houses, economic organizations, businesses and banks with wide regional and international influence. All of this existed before and after the Balfour Declaration issued by the British government in 1917, a declaration by which those who did not own gave to those who had no right. The British government bears responsibility for the catastrophic consequences inflicted on the Palestinian people as a result of this declaration. Since then, and although our people remain our, under occupation, they continued their journey, building and developing their country with the establishment of the National Authority in 1994. Our national institutions are recognized by international organizations for their merit and work, which is based on the rule of law, accountability and transparency and empowerment of women and youth in an environment of tolerance, coexistence of civilizations and non-discrimination. Moreover, we continue to strive to unite our people and land and to ensure one authority one law and one gun. And we are determined to convene parliamentary and presidential elections. Mr. President, Excellencies, our conviction is deep rooted and our position is clear regarding the use of arms of any kind. Not only do we call for the dismantlement of nuclear weapons, but we are also opposed to conventional weapons, which have caused such vast destruction of states in our region and around the world. We have thus been committed to fostering a culture of peace, rejection, rejection of violence, pursuit of sustainable development, and the building of schools hospitals, industrial zones, agricultural farms, and techno technological production, as opposed to establishing weapons factories and purchasing tanks and fighter jets. For we wish for our people to live in freedom and dignity, far from wars and destruction. The price of one tank can build a school, the price of one fighter jet can build a hospital that can protect people from all conventional and non-conventional weapons. We really want for our people to live in freedom and dignity, far from wars and destruction, and far from terrorism and extremism, which are being relentlessly combated in all areas of the globe. Accordingly, we have become party to 83 security agreements with states around the world, 83 states around the world, including the United States, the Russian Federation, and other European countries and other countries as well. Our goal from these agreement is one and only fighting terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, why are we here today? After a long journey and tremendous efforts to create a political path based on negotiations, which could lead to a comprehensive and just peace, as you are aware, we participated in the Madrid Conference in 1991 and signed the Oslo Accords in 1993. We were alone with the Israelis. 
and the Norwegians, you know that. This, these accords, the Oslo Accords, affirm the imperative of reaching a solution for all permanent status issues before 1999. Unfortunately, this has not become reality. Therefore, we should wonder, why has it yet to be achieved? Nevertheless, we persisted in our efforts to reach peace. We engaged in dialogue at Y River and Camp David. We participated in the Annapolis Conference. We engaged in dialogue with the former Israeli Prime Minister Olmert for eight months. Eight months. And we met with Prime Minister Netanyahu in the presence of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and George Mitchell. We also accepted President Putin's invitation to meet with Mr. Netanyahu in Moscow, but he has regrettably evaded participating in such a meeting. We also engaged with all seriousness with former Secretary of State John Kerry, but the Israeli government's intransigence caused the failure of all of these efforts. After all of this, how can it be said that it is we who reject nego negotiations? We have never refused any invitation to participate in negotiations. Please do not say that we rejected negotiations. We believe that negotiations are the only path towards the peace. So how can we reject negotiations? Please believe me, this is not true. Confronted with this deadlock, we have neither given up nor have we lost hope. We have come to the United Nations, believing in the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations, which affirms, inter alia, the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by force and affirms the right of peoples to self-determination. Article 40 and 41 reaffirm that. Nobody has held Israel accountable when it occupied our territories in 1948. So the Charter affirms the rights of people to self-determination, which are among the issues this August Council will address tomorrow. We continue to engage with all of its agencies and bodies in our quest to end this occupation of our land and people. Yet, in spite of, of all of that, the United Nations has failed to implement its relevant sol resolutions until this very day. Is this possible, ladies and gentlemen? Is it logical that, despite the adoption of 705 General Assembly resolutions, 705 resolutions, from 1948 until this very day, and 86 Security Council resolutions in our favor from 242 to 334. None of them have been implemented. Where are these resolutions which your August Council has adopted? 86 resolutions with no result whatsoever. Is it logical that Israel violates its obligation to implement resolutions 181 and 194? If you remember, these two resolutions were a sine qua non for, it was a condition for Israel to be accepted at the United Nations. And Moshe Sharet wrote a letter. He said that he was ready to implement these resolutions. And because of this commitment, Israel was accepted at the United Nations, but until this very day, these two resolutions have yet to be implemented. 181 and 194. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel is acting as a state above the law. It has transformed the occupation from a temporary situation, as per international law, into a situation of permanent settlement colonization that it has occupied uh, territories in 1967. It was supposed to be temporary. However, it has become permanent. It colonized all the areas that it wanted, including Jerusalem, that your August Council considers an occupied territory. How can this happen? 
it, Israel shut the door on the two-state solution on the basis of the 1967 borders. Here, we must reaffirm, as we have done in the past, that our problem is not with the followers of Judaism. No, Judaism is a monotheistic relig religion, as are Christianity and Islam. Our problem is only with the occupiers of our land and those denying our independence and freedom. Disregarding their religion. Mr. President, we met with the President of the United States, Mr. Donald Trump, four times in 2017. And we have expressed our absolute readiness to reach a historic peace agreement. We repeatedly reaffirmed our position in accordance with international law, the relevant UN resolutions, and the two-state solution on the basis of the 1967 borders. Yet, this administration has not clarified its position. Is it for the two-state solution or for the one-state solution? And then, in a dangerous, unprecedented manner, this administration undertook an unlawful decision which was rejected by the international community to remove the issue of Jerusalem off the table without any reason. It decided to recognize the city of Israel's capital and to transfer its embassy to the city. To Jerusalem. It did so ignoring that East Jerusalem is part of the Palestinian territory. It is occupied since 1967 and it is our capital which we wish to be a city open, open to all faithful or all the faithful of the three monotheistic religions. Especially Islam, Christianity and Judaism. It is also strange that the United States still lists the Palestine Liberation Organization on its terror list, and it imposes restrictions on the work of our mission in Washington under the pretext of congressional decisions since 1987. All of these international, bilateral, relations between us and the United Nations, including assistance and visits and broad visits, we then discover that the Congress believes we are terrorists. If the Congress thinks we are terrorists, the, how is the administration having uh, relations uh, with us? How is it visiting us? How is it providing assistance to us? How? How come? How do you help terrorists? And most recently, it has decided to punish the Palestine refugees by way of reduction of its contributions to UNRWA, in spite of the fact that it supported the agency's establishment and it has endorsed the Arab Peace Initiative, which calls for a just and agreed solution for the plight of the refugees in accordance with Resolution 194. The United States has contradicted itself. It has contradicted its own commitments and has violated international law and the relevant resolutions with its decision regarding Jerusalem. No country alone can solve a regional or international conflict without the participation of other international partners. Therefore, to solve the Palestine question, and this is our position and our belief, it is essential to establish a multilateral international mechanism emanating from an international conference and in line with international law and the relevant resolutions to solve the Palestinian question. A multilateral international mechanism. Mr. President, Faced with Israel's policies and practices in violation of international law and its non-compliance and non-implementation of agreements signed, our Central Council, the highest Palestinian parliamentary body, decided several weeks ago to review the relationship with Israel. Yes, we will review the relationship, considering that we have become an authority without authority. 
and the occupation has become one without cost. We are working for the occupation. We are working for the occupation. We are employees for the occupation. And we say that Israel must uphold its obligations as an occupying power. We do not oppose seeing Israel shoulder its responsibility in the West Bank because the situation is unbearable and unacceptable. And in spite of this, I, co I confirm to you our commitment to maintain our institutions and achievements which we have realized on the ground in Palestine as well as the international arena. Thanks to your assistance, we are determined to remain committed to the political, diplomatic, and legal path far from any violence through political negotiations and dialogue, which we have never rejected, never rejected. We will continue to extend our hands to make peace and we will continue to exert efforts to bring an end to the Israeli occupation based on the two-state solution on the 1967 borders and international legitimacy as per the relevant resolutions in order to achieve our national aspirations. However, at the same time, we will continue to oppose any attempt, regardless by whom, to impose solutions that contradict this legitimacy. Any solution that contradicts this legitimacy will be rejected. We have been granted the status of non-member observer state by the General Assembly. And on that basis, we have become a state party to 105 international treaties and organizations. We have been recognized by 138 states. All of this has further strengthened the status of the state of Palestine, which continues to strive for recognition by the rest of the states in the world, among which members of member states of the council that have not yet recognized the state of Palestine. even while knowing that recognition of the state of Palestine is not a substitute for negotiations. Recognition does not go against negotiations. It rather promotes negotiations. Therefore, I call upon members who have yet to recognize the state of Palestine to do so. And in the future, we will intensify our efforts to achieve admission to full membership in the United Nations and to guarantee international protection for our people. We will come, we will come to the Council. We will come and call for international protection to our people. The situation is no longer bearable. You have listened to the briefing of uh, the special coordinator. We hope for you to support our efforts to ensure the rights of 13 million Palestinians who yearn for an independent homeland, just like all other peoples of the world, and yearn for their state to take its rightful place in the international community. I say 13 million Palestinians. And you say that's not true, but we are we are 13 million palestinians whether we live inside palestinia inside palestine or in other foreign countries we come here before your august council ladies and gentlemen in the midst of the deadlock of the peace process due to the u.s decision regarding jerusalem israel's ongoing illegal settlement activities and its violation of the resolutions of the Council and its disrespect of the signed agreements. Latest of which, Resolution 2334. We are here because of the Palestine, Palestinian side's desire to continue working positively and courageously. We have courage to say yes and we have full courage to say no. 
This all relies on the international law and our interests. We are here to, be, to build a culture of peace, to reject violence, to save the principle of two states, to attain security and stability for all, to restore hope to our people and the peoples of the region, and to find a way out of the stalemate and crisis we are in. This is a strategic choice for the sake, for the coming generations in our region. Therefore, I will tell you about our plan. First, we call for the convening of an international peace conference by mid-2018, based on international law and the relevant UN resolutions with broad international participation and including the two concerned parties and the regional and international stakeholders, foremost among them, the, member, the permanent members of the Security Council and the International Quartet, as was the framework for the Paris Peace Conference and as envisaged for the conference to be convened in Moscow as per Resolution 1850. So we call for the convening of an international peace conference. The conference in Paris was attended by 74 states. So the outcomes of this conference should be as follows. One, acceptance of the state of Palestine as a full member of the United Nations. And this is what we deserve. Don't you think we deserve to be a full member? Why not? And we call on the Security Council to achieve that. We will come to you, taking into account General Assembly Resolution 6719 of 29 November 2012, which supported our non-observer membership, or excuse me, our observer membership, and guaranteeing international protection for our people on the lines of 1967. The formation of an international multilateral mechanism that will assist the two parties in the negotiations to resolve all the permanent status issued defined in the Oslo Accords. According to, to the Oslo Accords, Jerusalem, borders, security, settlements, refugees, water and prisoners are to be resolved through an agreement by both parties. conduct those negotiations on the basis of the international law and relevant UN resolutions and implement what is to be agreed upon within a set time frame and with guarantees for this implementation. Negotiations are to be defined by a framework. When it ends, the agreement must be in implemented. This is the only way to solve this long conflict in the Middle East. Two. During the period of negotiations, all parties must refrain from unilateral actions, particularly those that would prejudge, excuse me, prejudge the outcome of a final solution as set forth in Article 31 of the Oslo Accords of 1993. The Oslo Accords stipulate that all parties must refrain from unilateral actions and any settlement. Foremost must be the cessation of settlement activities in the territory occupied since 1967, including East Jerusalem, and suspension of the decision regarding Jerusalem and holding trans transfer of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, because this thwarts negotiations. in compliance with the relevant Security Council resolutions, including, in particular, resolutions for 476, 478, and at the same time, 
the state of Palestine would refrain from further joining organizations as we have previously committed ourselves to, namely 22 international organizations out of 500 organizations and treaties. We have committed and we continue to be committed, although unfortunately the administration did not fulfill its commitments. Third, the implementation of the Arab Peace Initiative as adopted, as adopted from A to Z and not from Z to A. According to the initiative, the Palestinian question must be solved and then regional issues will be solved. And this was affirmed by the initiative and all Arabs and Muslims which have adopted the Arab Peace Initiative. And when the initiative is implemented, when the state of Palestine is recognized in line with the borders of 1967 and the problem ends, all Arabs and Muslims will become ready to recognize the state of Israel. All Arabs and Muslims, 57 Arab and Muslim countries. This was stipulated in the agreements of Arab summits. And in this regard, we reaffirm the terms of reference for any upcoming negotiations, and they are as follows. Respect for international law. We are a state, but we are not recognized yet as a state. And yet, we affirm respect for international law and the relevant resolutions, in, and all of these resolutions must be respected, including Security Council Resolutions 242, 338, through to Resolution 2334 and the Arab Peace Initiative. Two, the preservation of the principle of the two state the state of Palestine with East Jerusalem as its capital, living side by side with the state of Israel in peace and security on the basis of the four June 1967 borders and rejection of partial solutions and a state of provisional borders. Let's let's be clear here. Let's be serious. We call for acceptance of minimal land swaps in equal value and ratio with the agreement between the two parties. Four. East Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Palestine and an open city for the faithful of the three monotheistic religions. The three. Five ensuring the security of the two states without undermining the independence and sovereignty of either of them. Yes, sovereignty is key. It cannot be preserved by occupation or by violence. We are ready to find solutions to protect the borders. Six, a just and agreed solution for the Palestine refugees on the basis of the of resolution 194 in accordance with the Arab Peace Initiative. And pending a just solution, continuation of the international commitment and support of UNRWA. Six million refugees, who will take care of them? If you stop your assistance to these six million refugees who are educated, if you end your assistance, they become terrorists or refugees in Europe. It's either that or you continue to support UNRWA for this, for, until the crisis ends. Mr. President, we are ready to undertake the longest journeys to the farthest places in the world in order to acquire our rights. But we are not ready to move one finger if anyone wants us to forsake these rights. We are ready 
to undertake the longest journeys. I am ready to take the longest journey, even though I hate to walk and everybody knows that. We will present any agreement reached with Israel to a general referendum among our people, respecting democracy and reinforcing legitimacy. And we believe we are a democratic country. So we call, we will have a general referendum. Mr. President, we have knocked on your door today. You who comprise the highest international body entrusted with the maintenance of international peace and security. You are the highest international body. We have presented our vision for peace. Hopefully, it will be received with wisdom and justice. We are ready to begin negotiations immediately in order to achieve the freedom and independence of our people, just like all other nations, and to achieve peace and security for all in our region and the world, so that future generations can enjoy the benefits of this peace, following the enormous sacrifices by our people of, the, of that dearest to them, among them our martyrs, wounded and prisoners. This Security Council, ladies and gentlemen, is the highest entity to which the peoples of the world seek sanctuary and protection. After this Council, we rest our issue to the Almighty. The Almighty. Until Judgment Day. For if justice for our people cannot be attained here, then to where should we go? We call upon you, we beg you to help us. Help us so that we do not commit an act that goes against our beliefs and your beliefs. Thank you so much. I thank His Excellency, President Mahmoud Abbas, President of the Observer State of Palestine, for his statement. The President now wishes to give the floor to the representative of Israel. General, I expected Mr. Abbas to stay with us and have a dialogue. Unfortunately, he is once again running away. Look what just happened in this room. Mr. Abbas came in, he put his demands on the table, and he left, and he's expecting you to deliver the results. It's not going to work that way. The only way to move forward is to have direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. Mr. President, it is unfortunate that we are meeting here today. For the past seven and a half years, the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, has refused to meet even once with Prime Minister Netanyahu. He has refused to negotiate peace. Yet, during that same time, Mr. Abbas has made seven trips here to the United Nations. Today, once again, rather than driving just 12 minutes, 12 minutes between Ramallah to Jerusalem, he has chosen to fly 12 hours to New York to avoid the possibility of peace. Mr. Abbas, you have made it clear with your words and with your actions that you are no longer part of the solution, you are the problem. What have you done to better the life of a single person in Ramallah or Gaza? The Palestinians need leadership that will invest in education, not glorify violence. They need leadership that will build hospitals, not pay terrorists. They need leadership that will negotiate with Israel, 
speak to us and not run away from dialogue. You just addressed the members of the Security Council, Mr. Abbas, and spoke of your commitment to peace. This is what you often do when speaking to international forums. But when you address your people in Arabic, you convey a very different message. A few weeks ago, when Abbas spoke to the PLO Central Committee, he called the national movement of the Jewish people, and I quote, a colonialist project that has no connection to Judaism. In the same shameful speech, he had the audacity to accuse Jews of supporting anti-Semitism in order to promote Zionism. This was not the first time he used such hateful language. In September 2015, as part of his attempts to delegitimize the connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel, he said, and I quote, the Jews had no rights to the Temple Mount and other holy sites, and the Jews desecrate them with their filthy feet. He then went on to incite his people to violence, saying, and I quote, we welcome every blood, every drop of blood spilled in Jerusalem. Mr. Abbas, you inspire a culture of hate within Palestinian society. You name schools and public squares in honor of terrorists. You encourage your children to hate by teaching them in school that Jews are descendants of apes. Just this month, your Fatah faction praised the terrorist who killed Rabbi Raziel Shevach. And you remained silent and refused to condemn the terrorist who killed a father of six as he was driving home to see his children. Mr. Abbas, your incitement does not end with rhetoric. You have made it official Palestinian policy to sponsor terrorism. In 2017, you spent $345 million paying terrorists for killing innocent Israelis. That is 50% of total foreign aid donated to the PA, 50% of your money. This is money you could have spent building 40 hospitals. This is money you could have used to build 172 schools every year. Your travel around the world seeking international intervention is an attempt to avoid the hard choices necessary for peace. You look to every possible forum because you don't want to actually negotiate with Israel. Mr. President, it is unfortunate, but this reckless behavior by Chairman Abbas is nothing new. It is a pattern he has continued in the spirit of over 70 years of missed opportunities by Palestinian leadership. We recently celebrated 70 years since the adoption of General Assembly Resolution 181. For the Jewish people, it represented international recognition of our, our historic rights to our homeland. We accepted the resolution immediately. It was not perfect. It did not provide us with all that we deserved, but it gave us hope for a better future. Yet, this past November, as Israel celebrated this milestone, the Palestinians marked this anniversary with grief and mourning just as they did 70 years ago when they chose to reject it. Since that moment in 1947, Israelis fought valiantly in too many wars against our enemy's intent to destroy our country. Over time, brave leaders emerged in Egypt and in Jordan, leaders who were willing to negotiate, compromise, and ultimately 
sign peace agreements with Israel. But the Palestinian leadership continued to choose conflict over coexistence. At the Camp David summit in 2000, Prime Minister Ehud Barak presented the Palestinians with an unprecedented offer. What was Mahmoud Abbas's reaction? To side with Yasser Arafat, claim it was a trap, and reject the proposal back in 2000. In 2005, Mahmoud Abbas was elected to chair the Palestinian Authority. The world hoped he would follow in the courageous footsteps of President Sadat and King Hussein, seek peace with Israel, and forge a better future for Palestinians. But he let his people down. Since the day he took office, peace plan after peace plan has been accepted by Israel and rejected by Mr. Abbas. Israeli leaders have sat with Mr. Abbas time and again. Three different Israeli prime ministers, three different American presidents. But every time there is an inch toward progress, Mr. Abbas runs away. In 2007, Prime Minister Ehud Olmert offered the most generous deal since Resolution 181, an almost complete withdrawal from Judea and Samaria, and a direct link to the Gaza Strip. The offer even included a plan to place the old city of Jerusalem, the gateway to our holiest sites, under international control. Mr. Abbas's response was simple an unequivocal no. Two years later, Prime Minister Netanyahu did something unprecedented. In an attempt to restart negotiations, he initiated 10 months freeze on Jewish construction in Judea and Samaria. This was a precondition that no Israeli Prime Minister, not even Yitzhak Rabin or Shimon Peres had ever agreed to. But soon enough, the 10 months passed and Mahmoud Abbas was nowhere to be found. He never came to the table. In 2013, Secretary of State John Kerry opened another attempt at negotiations. Once again, Prime Minister Netanyahu was ready to talk, ready to negotiate. Once again, Chairman Abbas responded by breaking his commitment to Secretary Kerry. He chose unilateral action, joining international conventions. <coughs> then he sought peace with Hamas, the internationally recognized terrorist organization, without even demanding that it renounce violence. Today, as we speak, the current U.S. administration is once again working very hard to make progress toward peace. Mr. Abbas, however, is once again looking hard for an excuse. This time he claims it was the American announcement about Jerusalem that drove him to reject negotiations. By recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, President Trump simply stated what should be clear to everyone. Let me be clear. For thousands of years, Jerusalem has been the heart and soul of our people. Jerusalem has been our capital since the days of King David, and Jerusalem will remain the undivided capital of the state of Israel forever. We will always insist on Israeli sovereignty over a united Jerusalem. But even fair-minded observers would agree that under any possible agreement, Jerusalem will be recognized internationally as our capital. After all these years of Abbas's rejectionism, one thing is very clear. When we extend a hand, Abbas extends a fist. Only when the terrorists of Hamas extend a hand does Abbas embrace them with open arms and without preconditions. Mr. Abbas has not insisted on the basic human gesture of demanding the return of the Israeli civilians and the remains of IDF soldiers 
הדר גולדין ודורון שאול, that Hamas is savagely holding. Mr. President, Israelis are an optimistic people. We weathered four bloody wars with Egypt while waiting for a leader like Anwar Sadat to courageously visit Jerusalem. He took decades of talks with Jordan until the time was right for King Hussein to enter into what he rightly called a peace of the brave. Three times a day, Jews in Israel and all over the world turn to Jerusalem and pray for peace. We ask the following from God. Sim shalom tova uvracha. Chen vachesed verachamim alenu v'al kol Yisrael amecha. Grant peace everywhere. Goodness and blessing. Grace, loving kindness and mercy to us and unto all Israel and all of the world. We have no doubt that the day will come when the Palestinian people will also be blessed with leadership that shares these noble aspirations. This will be a leadership that condemns violence and ends the shameful practice of paying salaries to terrorists. It will be a leadership that educates its people to tolerance instead of peddling in anti-Semitism. It will be a leadership that recognizes that Israel is, and always will be, the national homeland of the Jewish people. Israel eagerly awaits the day when this Palestinian leadership will emerge and will bring the hope for a better future for its people and our region. Thank you. I thank the representative of Israel, and I would like to now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the United States. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for being with us today, as well as Mr. Mladenov for his briefing. We are meeting today in a forum that is very familiar to all of us. This session on the Middle East has been taking place each month for many, many years. Its focus has been almost entirely on issues facing Israelis and Palestinians. And we have heard many of the same arguments and ideas over and over again. We have already heard them again this morning. It is as if saying the same things repeatedly without actually doing the hard work and making the necessary compromises will achieve anything. Beginning last year, we have tried to broaden the discussion, and we have had some success in doing so. I thank my colleagues who have participated in those broader discussions. One reason we did that is our well-founded belief that the United Nations spends an altogether disproportionate amount of time on Israeli-Palestinian issues. It's not that those issues are unimportant. They are certainly very important. The problem is that the UN has proven itself time and again to be a grossly biased organization when it comes to Israel. As such, the UN's disproportionate focus has actually made the problem more difficult to solve by elevating the tensions and the grievances between the two parties. Another reason we have attempted to shift the discussion is that the vast scope of the challenges facing the region dwarf the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As we meet here today, the Middle East is plagued by many truly horrendous problems. In Yemen, there is one of the worst humanitarian disasters on earth, with millions of people facing starvation. Meanwhile, militia groups fire Iranian rockets from Yemen into neighboring countries. In Syria, the Assad regime is using chemical weapons to gas its own people. This war has taken the lives of over half a million Syrians. Millions more have been pushed into neighboring Jordan, Turkey, and Lebanon as refugees, causing major hardships in those countries. In Lebanon, Hezbollah's terrorists exert ever more control, illegally building up a stockpile of offensive weapons 
inviting a dangerous escalation that could devastate regional security. ISIS has engaged in an inhumane level of cruelty in much of the region. They have been dealt severe setbacks in Iraq and Syria, but they are not completely yet destroyed, and they still pose serious threats. Egypt faces repeated terrorist attacks. And of course, there is the terrorist sponsoring regime in Iran that initiates and encourages most of the troubles I just outlined. These immense security and humanitarian challenges throughout the region should occupy more of our attention rather than having us sit here month after month and use the most democratic country in the Middle East as a scapegoat for the region's problems. But here we go again. I do not mean to suggest that there is no suffering in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Both sides have suffered greatly. So many innocent Israels Israelis have been killed or injured by suicide bombings, stabbings, and other sickening terrorist attacks. Israel has been forced to live under constant security threats like virtually no other country in the world. It should not have to live that way. And yet, Israel has overcome those burdens. It is a thriving country with a vibrant economy that contributes much to the world in the name of technology, science, and the arts. It is, it is the Palestinian people who are suffering more. The Palestinians in Gaza live under Hamas terrorist oppression. I can't even call it a governing authority, as Hamas provides so little in the way of what one would normally think as government services. The people of Gaza live in truly awful conditions, while their Hamas rulers put their resources into building terror tunnels and rockets. The Palestinians in the West Bank also suffer greatly. Too many have died, and too much potential has been lost in this conflict. We are joined here today by Palestinian Authority President Abbas. I'm sorry he declined to stay in the chamber to hear the remarks of others. Even though he has left the room, I will address the balance of my remarks to him. President Abbas. When the new American administration came into the office last January, we did so against the fresh backdrop of the passage of Security Council Resolution 2334. In the waning days of the previous American administration, the United States made a serious error in allowing that resolution to pass. Resolution 2334 was wrong on many levels. I'm not going to get into the substance now. But beyond the substance, perhaps its biggest flaw was that it encouraged the false notion that Israel can be pushed into a deal that undermines its vital interests, damaging the prospects for peace by increasing mistrust between the Israelis and the Palestinians. In the last year, the United States has worked to repair that damage. At the UN, I have opposed the bias against Israel, as any ally should do. But that does not mean I or our administration is against the Palestinian people. Just the opposite is true. We recognize the suffering of the Palestinian people, as I have recognized here today. I sit here today offering the outstretched hand of the United States to the Palestinian people in the cause of peace. We are fully prepared to look to a future of prosperity and coexistence. We welcome you as the leader of the Palestinian people here today. But I will decline the advice I was recently given by your top negotiator, Saeb Arakat. I will not shut up. Rather, I will respectfully speak some hard truths. The Palestinian leadership has a choice to make between two different paths. There's the path of absolutist demands, hateful rhetoric, and incitement to violence. That path has led and will continue to lead to nothing but hardship for the Palestinian people. Or there is the path of negotiation and compromise. History has shown that path to be successful for Egypt and Jordan, including the transfer of territory. That path remains open to the Palestinian leadership, if only it is courageous enough to take it. 
The United States knows the Palestinian leadership was very unhappy with the decision to move our embassy to Jerusalem. You don't have to like that decision. You don't have to praise it. You don't even have to accept it. But know this, that decision will not change. So once again, you must choose between two paths. You can choose to denounce the United States, reject the U.S. role in peace talks, and pursue punitive measures against Israel in international forums like the UN. I assure you that path will get the Palestinian people exactly nowhere toward the achievement of their aspirations. Or you can choose to put aside your anger about the location of our embassy and move forward with us toward a negotiated compromise that holds great potential for improving the lives of the Palestinian people. Putting forward old talking points and entrenched and undeveloped concepts achieves nothing. That approach has been tried many times and has always failed. After so many decades, we welcome new thinking. As I mentioned in this meeting last month, the United States stands ready to work with the Palestinian leadership. Our negotiators are sitting right behind me, ready to talk. But we will not chase after you. The choice, Mr. President, is yours. Thank you. The Canaanites, of course, were not there longer than Abraham. They were there from the time of Abraham, according to the book of Genesis, if the historical record of Genesis is to be believed. So they were not there any longer than the ancient Hebrews. They were there from the same time period. But the book of Genesis plainly says these were an accursed people. The prohibitions we read in the Torah and the law of Moses, you shall not sacrifice your children. You know, they were sacrificing children to Molech and burning ba infant babies alive. You shall not do the things as the nations I will drive out before you have done. The Canaanites were doing that. They were burning newborn babies alive. They were having sex with animals. They were having sex with children, spreading communicable diseases. They were doing these gross unspeakable perverted things, which is why God told Joshua to drive them out. Now, these are the ancestors of the modern Palestinian Arabs, according to Mahmoud Abbas. Of course, mitochondrial DNA would show that he's speaking absolute nonsense, if not out and out lies. The Palestinian Arabs are just not Arabs. They're descendants of, of Arabians, of people who came from what is today the Arabian Peninsula as in Saudi Arabia, etc., the ancient lands of Didan, and so forth. What he says is absolute nonsense, anthropologically and genetically, but that was his claim. After giving this speech, he took mysteriously ill and seriously ill, but it's been underreported in the media. No one knows why. He was taken to White Plains Airport in Westchester County, north of New York City, and put onto a 737 airplane and flown to... Baltimore, Baltimore Washington Airport, formerly Friendship Airport, and taken secretly to John Hopkins Medical Center, John Hopkins University Medical Center, probably one of the three leading hospitals in the world, research and teaching. And he, as far as we know, remains there at the present time, but there's been no statements forthcoming from the Palestinian Authority or from the American State Department as to why. This, we would wonder if it is a cause and effect, if it is some divine judgment. You want to be a Canaanite, I'll treat you like one. It could be, I don't know. But I know that it happened this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, Syrian forces coming to the aid of one branch of the Kurdish YPG in the Alrin district along the Syrian-Turkish border have come under heavy aerial attacks and artillery attacks by the Syrians. You have an uneasy situation now because the YPG are Kurdish and they are aligned informally, but very much aligned, or at least associated with the SDA, the Syrian Democratic Army, which is also Kurdish and are armed, equipped and trained by the Americans. Thus, you have Turkey aligned with the United States, at least on paper, and the Kurds aligned with the United States, at least on paper, 
fighting with each other. This further involves Syria. Pro-Assad Syrian troops have also moved into the area in an uneasy truce or cooperation with the YPG Kurdish forces. They don't like each other, but they find a common enemy in Turkey. This situation gets more and more complicated. The Russians and Iranians have been trying to exploit it for their purposes, but it has become such a convoluted mess. Nobody knows what to make of it, but it has been happening and it's been happening this week in Prophecy. The United Nations Security Council this week in Prophecy held emergency sessions to discuss the casualty figures and fighting surrounding East Delta, which has claimed the lives of at least 300, probably more, including women and children, in this area of Damascus, of Greater Damascus. It is intense fighting, and it shows that the Assad forces, despite Iranian and Russian backing, are not even in full control of Greater Damascus as of yet. But the fighting has been brutal, and the civilian casualties have been relentless. Russia has taken its usual stance of refusing to condemn the actions of the Assad government, simply giving the usual diplomatic two-step. Uh, about both parties needing to bear some responsibility for what is taking place and so forth, instead of an out-and-out -out condemnation of the deliberate targeting of civilians. Now, this compares to what happens in Gaza. When Hamas fires on Israeli towns and cities inside Israel proper, in the suburbs of Tel Aviv, they fire from population centers using their own civilians, women and children included, as human shields, even from areas around schools and hospitals. The Israelis never target civilians. They simply fire back in self-defense. Yet when they do, there's two standards. The UN generally, certainly most of the Muslim countries, and absolutely Russia, continue to fault Israel for doing something that it is forced to do in self-defense while saying nothing really in any kind of condemnatory manner when their ally Assad does the same thing this week in prophecy. Things, however, continue to heat up. Israel says its latest airstrikes in Syria are a message, a warning directed at Iran. The air raids pounded at least a dozen positions, including a command bunker. This escalation began yesterday after an Israeli warplane was shot down. The CBC's Derek Stoffel has the latest. Tensions have been rising for weeks now along Israel's northern borders and yesterday we saw the most serious encounter between Israel, Syria and Iran since Syria's long war began seven years ago. Israel launched two significant bombing raids yesterday targeting Syrian and Iranian military positions on the ground in Syria and that is significant for a number of reasons. It marks the first time that Israel has directly confronted Iranian military assets during Syria's war and it's the first time in decades that Israel has lost a warplane. An F-16 fighter jet was brought down by anti-aircraft fire yesterday morning. The two pilots escaped and are being treated in hospital. Now, this all began yesterday before dawn when an Iranian drone flew into Israeli airspace. Here in Jerusalem, Israel's prime minister had this warning. Israel holds Iran and its Syrian host responsible for today's aggression. We will continue to do whatever is necessary to protect our sovereignty and our security. Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke by telephone yesterday with the Russian president. The Kremlin says Vladimir Putin told Netanyahu that steps must be taken to make sure that there isn't a dangerous escalation in the region. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Jerusalem. Well, to help unpack this story, we've turned to Kamran Bukhari in Washington. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Global Policy. So, Kamran, let's begin with what we're hearing from the Israeli leadership, where you're hearing them blame Iran directly and also saying they'll do what they have to to protect their sovereignty. Try to make some sense as to how Israel is responding and where they need to move next. 
So, Natasha, I think that what happened uh, on a Friday night, uh, the night between Friday and Saturday, with regards to the drone and then the, uh, the strikes launched by the Israelis, uh, and then, of course, the, the shooting down of the uh, F-16, that's just the latest. That's, that's, a, that's a significant escalation from what has been a pattern for quite some time, which is that Israeli aircraft uh, from time to time conduct airstrikes on shipments of weapons moving from one side to the other. Uh, inside Syria uh, and uh, keeping an eye on Iranian movements and Hezbollah movements. Uh, I mean, this is the unintended consequence of uh, degrading ISIS, which is that Iran has an upper hand uh, in Syria. What do you make of Iran's role in all of this? Do you, is the Israeli prime minister right? I, I think he is right uh, in the sense that, uh, of course, Iran and Israel are enemies, and, and Iran being on the northern door, doorstep of Israel uh, is not good for Israeli national security. Uh, I mean, in, in when, you're, when you're dealing with strategic affairs, you don't uh, rely on, you know, the good or bad intentions. You look at capabilities, and so they're looking at Isra Iranian capabilities, uh, and they, they know that Iran has ambitions to expand its uh, uh, footprint in the region, especially in Syria, using Syria as a launch pad to project power beyond. And so that's a big concern for Israel. Uh, Kamran, looking at it from this vantage point, this is bad news for Israel. It's theoretically very bad news for Iran and certainly bad news for Syria. So who stands to gain from this? Uh, that's where I'll say that, you know, n none of these actors uh, have an interest in escalation, in confrontation uh, on, on a large scale. Uh, but at the same time, their uh, imperatives, their strategic interests uh, can collide. And, and therefore, uh, the likelihood of these kind of uh, cross-border clashes uh, and, and Israeli responses uh, is only going to increase with time. Uh, I mean, you, intent aside, uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the day, uh, their interests diverge sharply and, and therefore, we can't rule out the possibility of, of continued co uh, confrontation and perhaps, unfortunately, even escalation. Can you drill down a bit on that for me? You anticipate that we will see an escalation in this fighting? I mean, look, uh, if one side is sending in a drone, the other side is taking that as a hostile act and then uh, engaging in, in, in action, uh, in, in counter strikes, and therefore, then the, that puts the ball back in the Iranian Syrian court. And therefore, you know, it's a tit for tat. And so the question is perceptions and misperceptions. Uh, you know, will they contain the situation to the current levels? Or is there a risk, a danger of escalation? Um, I'm not taking any chances, and I don't want to rule out the possibility of escalation, even though none of the actors involved want to go down that uh, road. So what would need to happen within the next day or so for all of this to settle down? I think that you know the, the ball is in the uh, Syrian-Iranian court. Uh, they may be uh, emboldened by the fact that they've brought in down uh, an Israeli F-16, which hasn't happened, you know, uh, in quite a while. Uh, so they may be encouraged to to escalate or to counterstrike, uh, and and that's the problem. One side takes a step, the other side has to uh, uh, counterman that, and then you know you you have a tit for tat. And I think I'm going to watch for what the Iranians will do, and of course uh, the Israelis uh, have continued to remain vigilant and conducting preemptive strikes. So how do the Syrians and the Iranians react at the next uh, Israeli uh, preemptive strike? The Iranian foreign minister, Abbas Agrahi, said that Iran is in Syria to fight terror and to fight Israeli hegemony. He said that the political uprisings that took place in Iran last month were orchestrated by the Trump administration and are part and parcel of an attack on the Iranian economy. But this is what becomes interesting. He is now saying that Iran, not the USA, Iran is considering withdrawing from the agreements concluded by John Kerry and Barack Obama, in which Barack Obama agreed to fund radical Islamic terror sponsored by Iran by unfreezing $150 billion to the Iranian regime to kill Americans and to kill moderate Muslims, to kill 
Israelis to kill anybody they don't like, courtesy of a check written by Barack Obama, in effect, and delivered by John Kerry. Now, Iran is claiming it is thinking of withdrawing. The reason being, they have not been able to get banking credits or certain contracts because European companies are afraid of retaliation from the American government that would affect transatlantic trade. So now the pressure being levied by the Trump administration against Iran is affecting international banking and European policy in terms of trade relations with Iran, causing Iran to wonder if there is indeed a value in continuing with this Obama sellout themselves. Most interesting, but it's happened this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Nigerian military managed to rescue a further 76 Christian girls from Boko Haram at the Nigerian town of Date. 13 girls remain missing. We continue to urge prayer for their rescue. This week in prophecy, once again, Recep Erdogan is showing his true colors. He stated in a public address that Syria and Iraq are in the hearts of the Turkish people like their own homeland, Turkey. He says that no foreign flag anywhere will fly or should fly where the Adhen, that is the Turkish word for the Islamic call to prayer, is heard. In other words, he's issuing a declaration of intent or ambition to see the restoration of the Ottoman Empire that was dismantled following the Turkish defeat in the First World War. This would stretch from Southeast Europe, from the Balkans, include much of Greece. It would include certainly the Bosporus, but would include Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, most of the Arabian Peninsula, and at least two-thirds of North Africa. He's seriously, seriously proposing this as a national goal, Turkish hegemony over the Middle East and over Southeast Europe. The man is either demonized, he's certainly megalomanic, and he's playing a Islamic nationalist card in the character of the same Islamic nationalism that was responsible for the murder of perhaps over two million Armenians a century ago that to this day Turkey has refused to acknowledge. To say nothing of the continuous Turkish occupation of Kurdistan as the Kurds would see it. But this is Erdogan. Yet this man is a member of NATO. He heads a nation that is a member of NATO and that some people, some people, such as David Cameron, wanted to bring into full European Union integration, releasing millions and millions and millions of more Turks with the right to work and live in Britain and in continental Europe, in addition to those who are already there, particularly in Germany. This is Recep Erdogan this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, Benjamin Netanyahu was met with another legal challenge to his premiership in the interpretation, at least, of the Israeli mainstream media. One of his former confidants, Shlomo Filber, who was director of the Ministry of Communications, turned state's evidence, willing to testify seemingly against Mr. Netanyahu concerning a scandal involving Bezik, the Israeli equivalent of ATT or British Telecom, the National Telephone and Communications Company. Mr. Filber was a leader of Yesha, the Council of Settlers from the West Bank. 
He also had been the financial assets manager of the Israeli railways and a long-standing, confident political ally of Mr. Netanyahu. But he is now prepared to testify. Again, it's remarkable that what we see happening on the other side of the Atlantic with Mr. Trump, where the political enemies of Mr. Trump are resorting to the judiciary because they cannot democratically win an election, the same is happening in Israel. The Israeli left cannot win an election against Mr. Netanyahu, or at least not against the Likud Party coalition, so therefore they are resorting to legal means to try to destroy him. Whether or not these charges or allegations have credence is another matter. One of the allegations involved is that a news website controlled by Bezik, very popular in Israel, would give favorable coverage to Mr. Netanyahu in exchange for certain kinds of concessions and so forth, in the desire of Bezik to maintain a communications monopoly. Again, very similar to what happened with the breakup of ATT in the United States with Verizon and so forth, and the legal battles that followed that. But it took place and is taking place in Israel this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, although what happened in 2017, it was announced this week that Unit 8200, it's the Israeli equivalent of the British GCHQ or the American NSA, National Security Agency, Signal Intelligence that they were decisive in providing the intelligence that prevented an ISIS attack on a commercial airliner bound from Australia to the Persian Gulf. It came out that Israeli ministers going back to 2010 and again in 2016 covertly visited the United Arab Emirates for secretive defense cooperation. And so what we see happening now because of the threat and the growing threat of Iran, since Barack Obama greased their wheels with $150 billion, that defense cooperation secretly has been going on between Israel and some of the more moderate Gulf states. Again, in the shadow of the Iranian threat. But it was the Israeli Unit A200 that effectively provided the intelligence that prevented this attack on a commercial airliner. Quite a situation, indeed. Upwards of 200 Russian mercenaries from the Wagner PLC may have been killed, former Spaznets, former Russian commandos, recruited as civilian mercenaries, but operating at the behest of Russian intelligence in league with the Assad regime and Iran may have been killed by American air artillery forces, Apache helicopters and drones, together with the American SDA following the attack by the Russians, the Iranians, and the Syrians along the Euphrates River. We need to be very careful and very prayerful as we watch how this will unfold. It is not difficult to see how the United States could become somehow engaged in air-to-air -air combat with Russian aircraft. But it is almost inevitable if this continues that at some point the Israelis will. Finally, this week in prophecy, <coughs> the Christian world mourns the passing of Billy Graham. We've received massive amounts of emails and communications. I received one yesterday to which I responded or attempted to respond today, even though I have not issued any statement or obituary concerning Billy Graham, it simply went to the archives and found statements I made concerning Billy Graham's parlances with Richard Dixon in the White House, in which he made statements that were demonstrably if not maliciously anti-Semitic at one time, statements for which he later apologized. But statements that were first disclosed by Nixon aide H.R. Haldeman in his book that Billy Graham denied. After denying these, the, when the Watergate, <coughs> once the Watergate tapes were declassified following the denial, 
Billy Graham was confronted with the reality of his own voice on the tapes and had to admit that it indeed happened. His claim was that he forgot and he again issued apologies to the American Jewish community. My own views of Billy Graham are identical to those of our brother, Dave Hunt, who is now with the Lord. But Dave Hunt's comments on Billy Graham, his life and his ministry, are still available on YouTube, and I concur with them completely. At one time, I had a very, very high view of Billy Graham, extremely high. I financially supported his ministry. I liked him. He was something of a hero to me at one point in my Christian life. And there is no doubt when he began in Los Angeles in the post-war era in the late 1940s, he was a very different kind of preacher than he later became, although he consistently preached the gospel faithfully. In the late 1940s, Billy Graham stated that the gospel of Jesus has three primary enemies. Romanism, that is Roman Catholicism, what he called Mohammedism, that is Islam, and Marxism, communism. That's what he said then. In time, he changed his position. He took the Templeton Prize, again, a uh, accolade of liberal Protestantism and secular humanist interfaith philosophy. He spoke at Notre Dame, but drew no distinction between the Gospel of Rome, which is sacramentalist, and auto atonement for sin and purgatory, and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. He abandoned his earlier positions. I worked with Billy Graham Crusades in London 89 in the UK. And I recall he had the pedophile protecting Archbishop of London, Cardinal Basil Hume, on his platform with him. Uh, they were putting converts into some very dodgy churches. I was there and I saw it and I would never work with the Billy Graham Crusade again after that. I do not deny his personal commitment to Christ. It's undeniable. I do not and cannot deny he preached the true gospel. And many of the things alleged about him, such as his being a Freemason, are unproven. Probably not true. But it is also undeniable that he compromised majorly on the ecumenical issue along the line of his British chum, John Stott. It is also true that he compromised with liberal Protestantism and he did not hold to the same kind of doctrinal orthodoxy he did in his earlier days of the ministry. These are simple facts. His second in command was Leighton Ford of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association in Minneapolis. He went on to compromise with interfaith worship. This was all very sad to me. This was not the Billy Graham I knew. Although I had not been a believer yet, and I never would have went to a Billy Graham crusade or anything, I watched Billy Graham on TV when I was smoking marijuana once because I disliked him because of his association with Richard Nixon. During the Watergate scandal, Billy Graham damaged his own credibility and the credibility of his ministry by his association with the corrupt Nixon administration that he endorsed, which was a criminal enterprise. Nonetheless, Billy Graham spoke about Jesus being the truth. Not that he knew the truth or he knew how to find the truth or he knew where the truth was, that he was the truth. And that was one of the things that God began to use to draw me to the way of salvation in Jesus. Billy Graham has had an impact on many people, I being one of them, even though I did not and probably never would have come to faith through a Billy Graham crusade. God certainly used him in the lives of many people, and I'm not disincluded. No, it was with great reluctance that I would say anything adverse about him. He denied making these remarks that H.R. Holderman published in his book, but then when the tapes were declassified and it was his own voice, he had to admit that he did say that, and he apologized. He said he didn't remember once again and so forth. And it was the usual thing with him and Nixon. The Jews this, the Jews that. He said the Jews are responsible for the pornography. Not all of them, but there was the Jews. Now look, 
anybody who knows anything about that ugly industry, and I know people who've been saved out of it, know that Jews were never anything more than second-rate players in it. I was devastated when Billy Graham, in the Oval Office, was talking this way with Richard Nixon, a corrupt president driven from office who was a criminal. And Billy Graham was partaking in this, and then he denied it. And then when it was proven by recorded tapes, he had to admit it. Of course, he apologized. Something wrong here. It caused me to lose a great deal of the respect I once had for Billy Graham. But it was not only or even mainly his anti-Semitic comments with Nixon. It was the ecumenical issue, his compromise with liberal Protestantism and the Templeton Prize. It was things like that that bothered me. Now, I do not doubt or deny for one second he's a brother in Christ. I do not doubt or deny for one second that he's now with the Lord in glory and he's receiving a reward for the many people who came to faith through him. Although, by his own admission, most of those professions are people who fell away or were never truly saved, essentially. Nonetheless, I don't downplay what he did. He's preached the gospel to more people in history, both live and through mass media. But again, I make a distinction between early Billy Graham and later Billy Graham. Move on now to his son, Franklin, and to at least one of his daughters. I do not agree with his son, Franklin, appearing on TBN. I don't think he needs to do that. I wish he were not doing that. Nonetheless, I have a much higher view of Franklin Graham than I did of his father. Franklin has boldly stood out on fundamental issues. He's told the truth about radical Islam and its threat to America. I have a lot of time and a lot of respect for Franklin. I would urge prayer for Franklin Graham, who is now in de facto leadership of that ministry under Christ. Billy Graham also has a daughter who is a splendid woman. And some of the people who came up in ministry with Billy Graham, like Cliff Barrow and Edie Tornquist uh, Carlson, and uh, Yoni, the, the artist, these are tremendous people of God, brethren in faith. I prefer to look at the good than the bad, but I can't deny the bad. Nonetheless, before I said anything, before I said a word, I had both people attacking myself and Moriel for having not denounced Billy Graham as a false brother, which I don't believe he was, but I also have people denouncing me for the fact that I pointed out his hegemonism and his anti-Semitism and so forth for what it was. Now, I would like to think that he did indeed repent of the anti-Semitism. But he never withdrew his statements on ecumenism or liberal theology. Never. I remember in London, the churches they were putting people into who came to faith through him. I remember that cardinal on the platform in Wembley Stadium. I remember the people he had on the platform with him in Earl's Court Arena in London, as it was then, like, like the Madison Square Garden of, of the UK at the time, before the O2 was built. Uh, there's good and there's not so good. I want to focus on the good. But I cannot pretend there's not the not so good. But that's true of all of us. If somebody who God blessed and used as mightily and as splendidly as God used and anointed Billy Graham can make such serious mistakes, much the same as a good king like Hezekiah or, or King David or King Josiah. Or if a man who began so right, like Martin Luther, could have ended so badly, where does that put people like me? Where does that put the rest of us? If they can mess up, so can we. It's easy to condemn their mistakes and their faults. 
And I'm not suggesting we sweep them under the rug. They're too publicly known for that. It's part of their legacy, whether we like it or not. But let's remember, who can stand before the living God? If they can mess up, we can mess up. Yes, they messed up. But yes, Billy Graham stood up and said, there are three enemies of the gospel, Islam, Roman Catholicism, and Marxism. That was in him, that was in me, and that was in you. May the Lord be graciously merciful to all of us. I thank God for those who are still walking with Christ who came to faith through Billy Graham. I have a fondness for his son, even though I don't always agree with him, particularly concerning TBN, I usually agree with him. He has a daughter who seems to be an excellent woman of God. And I, above all, urge prayer for Franklin Graham. I urge prayer for Franklin Graham in that ministry. I'm sure that what I've said is going to offend many people. I'm sure others will agree with me. I have to leave that to you. But that has been This Week in Prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening. This is Morial Ministries.